uh, welcome uh, to this joint webinar by SSC and uh, Sailmar. Um, you'll get to learn about uh, what we do individually as companies, uh, but more importantly, uh, you'll learn about um, what we are developing and what we are uh, working on uh, together um, and how we are taking steps to uh, use data as the source for sustainable transition. Uh, more specifically, how our customers use data as a source for sustainable transition. Um, uh, and um, obviously, we'll be speaking extensively about the digital product passport uh, and as I say, PIM. Um, and I'm going to start by giving you a short overview of what we'll be talking about for the upcoming hour. Um, the welcome is obviously that box is already ticked, so we can skip that. Um, and uh, right after uh, we go through this uh, agenda, um, I'm going to be speaking about uh, what Sirmar does, uh, what our company does, uh, what a DPP is, a digital product passport, um, the challenges that companies face in uh, this transition to more sustainable practices, but also what the opportunities are. Um, and I'll be speaking about C Passport, which is the, the digital product passport that we developed as a company. Um, next up, um, I'll uh, switch, uh, uh, I'll, I'll give the presentation to uh, Tim uh, from SSC. Um, he'll be speaking about uh, the product information management systems, uh, what they are and how you can use them as a company. Uh, he'll be speaking about how to create structure in the chaos that data often uh, is or presents. Um, and he'll be speaking about the data processing uh, process. Um, and last but not least, as indicated, um, we are working together to help our customers uh, make this sustainable transition using data. Um, so we'll uh, speak about how, what this looks like in practice uh, and we'll give a short demo as well so you can see how it works. Right. Um, good to mention before we get started um, uh, with uh, the SIRMA part of the presentation is that we have both a chat box and a Q&A. Um, uh, feel free to use the chat box if you have comments, uh, but if you have specific questions, uh, I'd like to ask you to direct them to the Q&A section. Um, uh, we have some colleagues, uh, Rens from uh, SIRMA uh, and Peter from uh, SRC, uh, who are uh, monitoring the chat box. Uh, oh, sorry, the Q&A, and we'll be answering questions directly. Uh, and they'll also be gathering some relevant questions for us to discuss uh, at the end of the webinar. Uh, we hope to end a couple minutes uh, uh, before the end of our lunch break uh, at one o'clock. Um, so um, we'll have some room to, to dive into some deeper questions that might be relevant for all of you. Um, so know that you have the, uh, the possibility to do so. All right, the digital product passport and PIM, um, the reason why we are in this uh, webinar, the reason why you joined us to, to learn something today. Um, the starting point of this uh, webinar is basically that I have to uh, explain to you very briefly uh, what our two solutions are uh, and why we have joined forces. Um, first off, uh, we had a solution uh, which is called C-Passport, a digital product passport, in which we uh, uh, record material composition and impact of products, uh, which is used as a communication and sales tool and as input for reporting. And on the other hand, uh, SRC uh, had a PIM system uh, that they developed, uh, which serves as a single source of truth uh, for companies uh, uh, collecting all of their data, gathering all of their data in one system, uh, which is validated against data standards uh, and which is a generic solution, uh, but can be built up in modules. Um, and before we dive into more depth into these systems, uh, the important thing is that uh, we found each other in, uh, in our understanding of the, these challenges that uh, companies face. Uh, and an important one is that you want all relevant product information in order, uh, and you want to prepare for a circular transition. Uh, I'll dive a little bit deeper into uh, what that circular transition entails, but this is basically how we found each other uh, and uh, why we've been working together uh, to help uh, companies prepare for this uh, circular transition and take concrete steps. First off, Sirmar, who are we and why am I speaking to you in this uh, webinar? Um, we basically do three things. Um, everything has something to do with the circular economy. That's, that's our thing. Um, the first activity uh, is that we uh, uh, develop 
uh, and, and advice on circular strategies, products, and concepts. Uh, this is in cooperation with uh, with our customers, um, and our customers are companies uh, all over um, the, the spectrum of companies. Uh, so you can uh, imagine we have some companies who are, for instance, in personal protection equipment. Um, uh, we help them develop uh, circular sh uh, safety shoes. Uh, but on the other end, we also help uh, supermarket chains uh, to uh, create a circular supermarket. Um, so uh, a very broad uh, uh, field of work um, uh, where we try to take steps in, in, uh, in the direction of more circular strategies, products and concepts. The second activity is that we operationalize uh, these, um, uh, these concepts, these products and these strategies. And that uh, simply means that we help uh, our customers find uh, reverse logistics solutions, uh, that we help them find the, the proper uh, recycling uh, solution uh, in order to, to make sure that what is uh, uh, designed uh, is also put to practice. And the third activity is that we have uh, created a tech system, uh, a digital product passport called C Passport, uh, and that helps us uh, in our work, but it also helps our customers um, because they use this uh, uh, tool um, autonomously uh, in order to realize uh, the two activities that I already discussed. So we can uh, come up with incredibly uh, well-designed products. Uh, we can make sure that all the infrastructure uh, to give them uh, a better uh, end-of-use solution uh, is in order. Um, but if we haven't recorded all of this information in one single location uh, where we can uh, quickly and easily access that information, um, we might lose all of the circular potential. Uh, to those of you uh, who haven't scanned the QR, uh, that is on screen yet, I'd like to invite you to do so. Um, uh, right next to the QR, you can see a, uh, a lamp, um, uh, which is just an example of, uh, uh, of a digital product passport, of C passport that we have already put into practice. Um, uh, and uh, might be nice to, to look at it every now and then as we go through the slides uh, to give you an idea of how it works in practice. Uh, but you'll have enough screenshots of the, the application uh, as well uh, as the demo. Next up, um, we have to talk about what a digital product passport is. Uh, why uh, do our customers use it and why do we uh, use it in our uh, 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 advice towards cu customers? Um, to put it very simply, uh, we all already are familiar with uh, product information that is on physical products. So um, if you have a, a product in your hands uh, when you're in the store, you might find an energy label or you might find a, a CE uh, 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 trademark, uh, which tells you something about uh, what the uh, product uh, entails. Uh, maybe it's energy use, uh, possibly what it's made of, or whether it's recyclable or not. Um, but we can do this better. Uh, we can take more insights from the data we, we, we already possess and uh, gather, uh, and we can start doing so uh, digitally. Um, this is going to be uh, a, uh, um, a mandatory um, aspect of putting a product in the market in Europe. Uh, from 2027 onwards, the first product group, groups will uh, uh, be obligatory to uh, uh, have a digital product passport. Um, the first groups are textiles, uh, batteries, and electronics. Um, but that's strictly from a compliance uh, standpoint. Um, in essence, uh, you want to use the digital product passport to gain direct access to product information uh, and uh, for both consumers and companies to make more informed, sustainable choices. Uh, and lastly, for authorities to help them with their controlling tasks. Um, so in, in terms of transparency, we want to show what we do. Uh, we want to uh, uh, help authorities keep a check on, uh, on what is going on. But most importantly, uh, we want to make more informed uh, choices about how sustainable products are. Um, and a digital product passport should be acce easily accessible. Uh, and there are already lots of solutions out there. Uh, for instance, the QR code that you might have already scanned. Uh, but you can also access uh, the passport through, for instance, RFID. Uh, if our customers or others who use uh, different uh, product passports uh, have incorporated that in their products. So why uh, do we want to? Uh, use digital product passports. Basically, if we look at it from a European perspective, there are a number of challenges. Um, and uh, I've 
added some images of a couple of these challenges. And the first is that we have a shortage of materials. Uh, some of those materials might be critical raw materials, uh, but also very plainly, uh, uh, for instance, building materials are getting more expensive. Um, uh, and besides that, uh, uh, these uh, materials are also getting more and more expensive. Uh, and that might be because of scarcity on the European market. Uh, but that might also be because we uh, uh, we buy these products and materials from from different parts of the world, uh, and through conflict uh, or other politi geopolitical um, uh, causes, we might see a rise in prices of materials over the coming years, um, and um, that means that gaining a grip over your material use is a very simple economic fact of life. Um, uh, and a very uh, simple reason to start uh, taking steps to create insights into the materials that you use, but also what alternatives are available uh, and what that might entail for you as a, as a company. And the third one, uh, which is uh, basically derived from the fact that we use all of these materials, is that um, greenhouse gas emissions are a direct consequence. Um, we often uh, come across companies that uh, focus on all sorts of things that cause uh, uh, emissions like um, uh, travel to work. Um, uh, maybe they want to add solar panels to their production factory. And all of those things are incredibly important. Um, uh, but the biggest impact is in our material use. So if we want to take real steps in uh, creating a more sustainable circular economy, uh, that should be where the focus is. All right, uh, and that's what I wanted to point out as well. Um, it's an essential transition that we're facing. Um, we are still uh, very much uh, living in a linear economy uh, where uh, the the, uh, the main part of products is is being taken from nature sources, um, uh, made into products, and then disposed after use. Uh, and in a circular economy, and I have to add that this is a very simplified uh, uh, image, uh, we make uh, products, uh, we use them up, we recycle them, refurbish them, recover them in some way, um, uh, everything to recover these materials and use them again. Uh, and we basically get rid of the waste element uh, uh, in that chain. It is time to act. Uh, an important message that I want to bring across, uh, and it sort of builds upon what I've already said. Uh, but for our customers, there are three main reasons to work uh, with the digital product passport. Um, and the first one, uh, like I said, is to gain grip on the material use. So I, they want to know what materials they are using. Uh, and in order to, to gain grip uh, uh, of the, the kilograms, uh, the number of, of materials that they're using, uh, they have to start recording this on a product level, on a product level, and then expand this to their uh, uh, to all of their activities. Um, and by doing so, they can gain grip on their emissions as well. Um, and that is important for all sorts of reasons, uh, most of which uh, you guys probably understand. Uh, but some of the reasons why will follow from the next two points. Uh, the second one is that we have uh, uh, a customer, um, I think not only on the European market, but worldwide, that is demanding more and more from companies in terms of uh, transparency, uh, that knows very well uh, or wants to know as well as possible what the impact is of their decisions. So they'll be looking for companies uh, that give them this information, that allow them to make better choices. Um, and as an extension of that, uh, as a company, you are probably always looking at uh, your proposition uh, and how you can uh, continue this proposition, uh, improve it over the coming years to stay relevant uh, and to, to keep doing uh, what you're doing or do it even better. Um, and the third one uh, is compliance. Uh, and from a compliance perspective, we see all sorts of directives and regulations uh, without, without diving too deep into those. Um, they all ask for evidence. Um, and that's not a negative thing um, uh, because the evidence uh, is always in terms of what are you doing right now uh, and how can you uh, make sure or how are you going to take steps towards uh, uh, doing better. Um, 
And in order to do so, you have to gather information uh, to be able to, to argue uh, where you are today and where you will be going tomorrow. And that's why we had to find a solution. A very short uh, overview of, of some of the functionalities uh, and data points that you will find in C Passport, our digital product passport. In essence, it focuses on two components, which is material composition and end of use and next use. Um, and this can be very simple or very complex. Uh, it all depends on where you are as a company, uh, what you fill in. Uh, the idea is that you start with uh, the knowledge that you have and start generating insights and improving as you go, um, sort of in line with what compliance asks of you, um, uh, but also what your customer asks of you. Um, uh, they will expect a lot, uh, uh, but in essence, they also want you to show what you're going to do to do better. So what you record in this passport is the materials uh, and the composition. Uh, you see the pie chart uh, that includes all the materials uh, that this Signify uh, accent projector uh, consists of. And you can do this as detailed as possible. If you only know that your product consists of plastics and metals, uh, that is what you're going to record. Do you know more exactly whether it's recycled content or virgin content? Then that is what you're going to add to the passport. And you can even dive into the exact uh, uh, plastic that is used in the product. So if you know, for instance, that it's a recycled PET or a recycled polypropylene, uh, we have the, uh, a database with all of the, uh, these products uh, uh, connected to their uh, respective impacts. Uh, so you can add those to your passport and that's when the, the magic uh, starts happening. Um, uh, and you can also add, uh, and that's very important, whether the material is going to be recovered. Uh, so basically, we have a distinction between three end of use treatments. Uh, products can be either incinerated. Um, there are other ways uh, uh, of disposing of products, but we simplify this to incineration, which means you lose all of the material after a use cycle. Um, the second is refurbishment. Um, so you refurbish the products to be used again or you recycle uh, the products uh, and re-enter the material into new uh, uh, streams of, uh, of, of, of sourcing. Um, these three options uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can add to, to a, a unique product, but you can also uh, uh, go into further detail. For instance, if you have this uh, signify lamp, you can indicate that the, uh, the casing is recycled end of use, but that the glass uh, uh, at the front of the lamp is not going to be uh, recycled or refurbished and that it is going to be incinerated. Uh, and then the product passport, as we built it, will auto automatically uh, calculate the exact end of use percentages and also the associated impacts, which is the next step that I wanted to talk about. Um, C passport contains six KPIs. Uh, three of those are actually four of those. Uh, well, strictly speaking, speaking, five of those are automatically calculated, uh, but three of them are absolute figures, uh, and that's CO2, energy, and H2O. Um, uh, you can see in the on the left uh, uh, where you would find those on the passport in the second tab. Um, and in addition to these th three absolute figures, um, uh, it indicates the materials that you have saved compared to incineration. So if you have a product that is 80% recycled at the end of use, uh, then this uh, uh, KPI will indicate what portion of weight that represents. Um, this is relevant for internal insights, uh, but there are several uh, uh, European reporting um, uh, 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 regulations that ask, for the, that ask for this information as well. Um, so if you want to use that information for reporting, you can generate that data uh, from a product level and you can translate it to, to your entire product collection. Uh, additionally, we have the CO2 price and social return on investment. Uh, the CO2 price is uh, connected to the European trading system of emissions. Um, so we connect that to uh, the CO2 that is emitted by the product and translate it to the price. Uh, we did so because uh, in some sectors like building and construction, uh, they already pay uh, beyond a certain threshold for their emissions. Uh, and for others, it's um, a valuable uh, KPI to use for internal communication, 
but also to prepare for the situation that might come or will probably come in more sectors where they will be paying for uh, emissions. Um, and then we have social return. That's not something we calculate, uh, but our customers can record the social return that's in their processes. For instance, uh, people with a distance to the labor market who um, help uh, uh, creating safety shoes, um, uh, you can express that in minutes per, uh, per item sold on the product as well. And then the last thing I wanted to, to talk about very briefly on uh, the KPIs is that there's always the first question that you would have to ask if you see any number that, that, that speaks of CO2 emissions or water use or energy impact, your first question should be, uh, what scope did you apply? Uh, so uh, which uh, parts of the chain did you include in your calculation? And for us, uh, the standard calculation uh, scope is uh, LCA+, plus, which translates to uh, cradle to cradle, which is more familiar to, to most people. Um, and it basically includes sourcing of materials up to the moment that you need the exact same amount of materials again. That can be in the same use cycle. So that would mean that, for instance, the plastic would be used for uh, another uh, signify lamp or in a different use cycle. So the plastic might be recycled uh, and used for a different application. Um, uh, so it, it's taken up in different plastic streams. Uh, we would argue that both are uh, are fine, um, uh, but you want to express uh, the impact of doing so. Uh, because if you start comparing products that you did find a good end of use solution for uh, with products that are strictly speaking linear, so that are incinerated end of use, um, the positive effect is only expressed in that next use cycle. Because we understand that throughout uh, 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 different sectors, there are different scopes that, are, that, you, that you might calculate with, or perhaps that might be asked by um, uh, controlling bodies, uh, or for instance, in, a, in um, uh, tender uh, situations, um, uh, you might want to calculate a different scope. So what we have uh, included in the passport is that you can choose whether you calculate cradle to gate, cradle to grave, or cradle to cradle, LCA plus. Uh, so you can determine on a passport level what scope you want to calculate with. Then information for all stakeholders. What role does this passport play uh, throughout the supply chain? As I already mentioned, uh, we need to make sure circular products come to fruition, uh, and we can only do so if we add uh, end of or use uh, information for the customer um, and for other players in that supply chain. Uh, by doing so, um, the passport has to be more than just a label or a, a PDF file. It has to be digital transparency of what you have organized and what you haven't organized. Um, so the idea is uh, that you connect it to the physical products and perhaps to your online channels, and that you add all the relevant information that, for instance, uh, the end customer needs to make sure this product is going to be recycled, uh, to make sure that it is properly disassembled, perhaps to assess whether this product is even fit to be returned and recycled, but also when it uh, arrives at a reverse logistics uh, provider, that it can understand uh, where it has to uh, uh, direct the product, what recycling solutions are available, uh, and perhaps even what next use uh, solutions are fit for this material and product. Um, and that is very simple uh, uh, through either QR codes or other identifiers. Um, uh, and that means that you have direct access either um, on a phone or a tablet, whatever device you want. Uh, the idea is that we create transparency throughout that supply chain. Then we arrive at the last slide that I wanted to talk about in terms of uh, the CIRMAR part of this webinar, um, that we are now facing a challenge. Um, we already have quite a few customers who use a, a lot of uh, digital product passports. It varies from small companies who use just a couple to companies who are already using hundreds or thousands of passports. Um, but if we want to make this a tool in which we can facilitate scaling up, uh, and and uh, enlarging the uh, the insights that we uh, gather from our available data, we have to start connecting to systems, to other systems that, for instance, have input data that is valuable for us. Um, additionally, um, uh, we want this to be a live document, and that means, on one hand, that you don't just 
create a PDF file with some information, but that you also have a tool where you can add information uh, that also has an impact on uh, the, for instance, the emissions uh, that come from a product. Imagine that you have a, uh, a lamp that you put, in the, put on the market uh, at this point in time and you don't have a recycling solution, uh, but two years down the line, uh, you do have a recycling solution. Um, in a linear economy, uh, it would be pretty difficult to uh, fulfill that circular potential um, um, because you lose the connection with uh, the, the end customer that, that uses the product. Uh, and it can be quite challenging to, to provide them with the information to help you uh, fulfill that potential. So what you might do is you put the product in the market with a QR code that connects to a digital product passport. And then two years down the line, you add the recycling instructions or refurbishment instructions that that end customer needs. And through scanning that QR code or other identifier, they gain direct access to that information and it automatically has updated the impact figures uh, that are associated with that new solution for the product. Um, so there's basically two challenges. How do we make sure that we can scale up and that we can uh, uh, add new passports in such a way that it doesn't become uh, another task for companies that they spend a lot of time and money on, but that they can gain real insights uh, quickly? That's the data question. And that's why we joined forces with SRC. And I'd like to hand over the presentation to Tim now. Yeah, thank you, Jasper. Uh, on behalf of SRC, to everybody, welcome to uh, to this webinar. Uh, well, like Jasper explained, is uh, is the question where to get your data, and um, that is where we see a joint vision on utilizing PIM as a source feeding the product data, or sorry, the digital product passport. So in short, on uh, on SRC, who are we, what do we do, and uh, why are we here? Well, SRC is a software company based in the Netherlands. We're located in, in Horn, north of Amsterdam, and we're a group of 35 IT and data fanatics that uh, manage and, and produce and manufacture two types of solutions. The first one being a solution to provide EDI, electronic data interchange, not particularly applicable to the DPP, but is one of the services that we provide. And the other one is product information management, uh, short PIM. Um, that is the solution that we provide on a European scale in two main markets, being food and beverage, and being a do-it-yourself in the building and, uh, building and installation sector. Um, we also have uh, customers who are active in chemicals, who are active in fashion, so we provide a full scope and full services uh, to our customers. Um, before we dive into the cooperation with the DPP, I want to take some time to dive in. OK, but what what is a PIM system? Um, like said on the previous slide, PIM stands for Product Information Management. And what it does, it facilitates companies to manage all the available information on a product level. That can be on, on a master product level, on for, uh, variants, on all the products that you have and manage that information in one system. So the whole organization uh, is looking at the same data, is working on the same record, creating a single source of truth, one central record per product in the system. This provides you first time right distribution of data, but also insights into data quality because every customer or every destination of your information has different requirements to the data that you share with them. If you're serving a retail chain, they might want to have different information than when you when you are serving a wholesaler or when you're working with uh, standardization institutes like GS1 or in the food sector, PS in food, or for instance, in the construction area, uh, the ATIM standard. So, all these requirements are managed from the central system, the PIM system, making sure that you publish the right information with the right destination on the right time. A PIM solution is modular. It is a, uh, you can tweak it to what you need and what you need to use to fulfill that data question. And of course, like Jasper also mentioned, um, PIM is just one source of your DPP. 
here there can be other sources as well. Um, so integrations are uh, an essential part of the solution that we provide. Integrating the BIM solution into the broader master data management environment, your IT infrastructure, making sure it connects to your ERP, to your WMS or website, your marketplaces and so on. So diving into why a PIM is created, it helps you to create structure from chaos. Uh, up until today, Excel is still the most used PIM system in the world, um, but it is serving a lot of challenges with different versions of Excel, everyone having a different version of the, of the file, even with SharePoint and a central storage location, there are a lot of people that take a copy to their desktop or uh, at home and work from different versions. So how to manage all those different versions, all those different sources within your company and, and get it into a structure. That is where PIM gets into place. Like said, it is a modular solution, but before diving in all these different modules, let's take a look at the process of that a PIM system facilitates. And it helps you manage your product information. And in this graph, it goes from left to right. It starts by gathering all your different sources of information that can be data pools like GS1, for instance, if you're a retailer, um, it can be direct feed from your suppliers. It can be internal systems like your ERP or your R&D development that launches a new, pro new product, or it can be manual input. We gather that information in a PIM system and process all these different records into a single record per product the golden record. That is where the enriching phase starts because that product is just the start of the information that you already have. But when we look on the right side, where you share that information with your customers, with your website, with marketplaces, and with your DPP, there might be information missing that is required by one of those destinations. So we facilitate a process and that's workflow driven, that has all different features to make sure that all your data gets enriched and your products get complete. By validating what information is in the system and validating that with the requirements of your destination, we make sure that the user knows when a product is ready, when a product is done and when it is complete and ready to be shared with the destination in hand. That is the process, and it, I, I make it really simple and really small, but in essential, that is the process that a PIM facilitates. As you can see on the top of this, uh, this graph, there are a lot of functionalities that you either use or do not use. Um, for instance, I wanna highlight a few. Uh, top left, a supplier portal, for instance, is not for everybody applicable. If you're a manufacturer yourself and you're not working with any uh, uh, suppliers, uh, you don't need that portal, but you do handle raw materials. And especially in light with the DPP, you need to know what the origin of those raw materials are. Where are they harvested? How are they harvested? What was the CO2 imprint to do? So by implementing a portal, even your raw material suppliers, your uh, co-producers, your half material producers can provide you the information according to your needs and standards directly into your PIM system. Um, the workflow on the, on the process tab helps you to facilitate that process through your organization, uh, providing that every department coming from logistics, procurement, sales, marketing, Everybody knows exactly what to do and gets the task in their in their box when applicable. But like I said, in the end, you want to feed your DPP with the correct information, and the system provides you a tool to manage that and provide this as an input for the DPP uh, in cooperation with additional sources when applicable. But we always say the proof is in eating the pudding, so uh, let's dive into okay. What is that chemistry between DPP, uh, as CMR explained, and SRC, and how does that work in practice? So I'll hand over to my colleague Tyler to provide you a short demo uh, on how this works. Thank you very much, Tim. I will quickly share my screen and I'll start the presentation.
Is the screen viewable, Tim? Yes, thank you very much. Yes, it is. As just explained, a PIM makes sure that the existing chaos of unstructured data comes together in a structured way. We can see this here in SRC PIM. For this example and presentation, we've used the GS1 data model to see all different kinds of attributes. Within this data model, we can see all kinds of information, like, for example, a GTIN or a GPC classification. But within here, we can also find things like indicators, if a item is a base unit or not, if it is an orderable unit or different indicators, we can also find information that relates to dates, when a product should be available, when the product information should be available. We can find things like measurements, depth, height, width, or weights. But we can also find information like descriptions in multiple languages, or for example, brand names. In most circumstances, this information would normally only will be shared with an organization like GS1. The big benefit of a PIM is that this information has only to be captured once and can be sent off to one or multiple endpoints to make sure that everybody collects the exact same information set. The big benefit that we have at SRC is on top of this GS1 model, for example, we have created the CIRMAR data model that collects and reuses the same information that we have for our GS1 fields. What we, have, what we have here in our data model are the attributes and the layout that are exactly the same as on the CIRMAR and C Passport website. This means that if you complete the GS1 variant of a field, for example, with ABC, the CIRMAR variant also contains a value ABC and not EFG. This to make sure that we have one golden record and exactly the same information that everybody receives at each destination. Also, we can validate data based not only on maybe the GS1 standards, but also the rules and regulations that CIRMAR have for creating a product passport. For example, we can see here that product name is mandatory to fill in and is marked in red to make sure that we complete this information before we send that data off to become a product passport. So what we can do with the big benefit of SRC PIM is if I would click on the name here, it immediately takes me to that field that I exactly need to complete to complete my data. So in this case, I would add a product name. I'll press save. And I can see at the hand of the green check mark that our product is now complete and is ready to be sent off to become a digital passport. But before we do that, we want to make a quick double check to make sure that our information is exactly the same as on our GS1 fields. For example, we can see here weight is 0.98 kilograms. If we have a quick look in our GS1 variant of the exact same attribute, we can see that the gross weight is exactly the same. We can also see that our materials have been filled in based on the GS1 versions of the same fields. So now we are sure that all the information that we're able to collect from the PIM system, we're able to send off to CIRMAR to create a digital product passport. So how do we send off our data to CIRMAR? We can do it in two ways. We can do it via bulk operations run on a schedule that the system automatically indicates a new record or a change record that has not yet been sent to CIRMAR and send that data off on a fixed schedule in bulk. Or we can do a quick manual send off of the data. How we do that is we gonna select our item based on a search filter. 
and we're going to, on the top of the screen here, press synchronize. We're going to confirm our sending of the data. We say synchronize. We see the progress bar is running. And then we see the number one popping up. That means we have one unread message in our PIM. And we can see our synchronization to CIRMAR was successfully finished. So now we know we have sent off our data to CIRMAR. So the next step is we're going to look at how the data looks on the C Passport website. And I will give the hand over to Jasper to show you how that looks. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Tyler. Um, yeah, I'll take over from here um, because what we see here is uh, the data that was uh, sent uh, by SSC PIN. Um, and basically, um, what we need to create uh, a passport are a certain number of, of data points, as Tyler already uh, explained. Um, and of course, uh, not every company has all of the data that you could fill uh, the digital product passport with. But the important thing here is that you can um, uh, you can have the basic data set uh, that is necessary to create a first passport uh, version. And then you can start supplementing and you can automatically update that information from what you have recorded in your PIM system. Um, so that just to understand that there's not a, uh, that everybody has a different starting point. Not everybody has as detailed information uh, readily available. Um, before I'm going to uh, navigate through the passport uh, quite uh, very quickly, um, I'd like to show that um, within the uh, presentation we already gave, um, there was a bit of a different look and feel to the passport than you see here. Uh, and that's for a very good reason, because what you're looking at right now is the internal version that our customers use. Um, and they uh, always create, or every passport that is created, comes with a public version uh, that is adapted to their specific uh, look and feel. Um, that is the first thing. The second thing is that they can choose which elements they want to display or not. Um, this happens to be a customer that is very happily uh, sharing this information. Uh, but if you want to, for instance, uh, not communicate a, a certain piece of information, you have the possibility to uh, uh, filter that out in the public version of your passport. Um, uh, we do so because some companies simply can't share, for instance, the full material composition of their products um, uh, because uh, of uh, competitors might, that might want to dive into their material composition and copy them. Uh, and for others, it's simply a matter of this is not relevant information uh, for my customers. So they can choose, for instance, to, uh, 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 to opt out of some of the KPIs that can be displayed on the passport. What you see here is some, some general information. Uh, and uh, as you might uh, not be used from your own passport, because that contains many pages, the idea is that you have one overview with all relevant information. Uh, and we just have a couple extras uh, besides the material composition that you see here, uh, the metals and plastics as recorded in the PIN system, uh, and the underlying exact uh, materials uh, that this consists of. Um, uh, in combination with the end of use treatment that is recorded for this product, uh, product lead to the impact calculation. Um, now on the public passport, you will only see uh, one number for each of these KPIs, um, but on the internal version, uh, we have accommodated a switch. So you can opt whether you want to calculate cradle to cradle or LCA plus, whether you want to limit this scope to uh, cradle to grave. So from the point that your materials are sourced up until the moment that they are processed and of used, which means they are incinerated, they are recycled, or they are refurbished, which also has impact. Um, but without the new sourcing of all the material you have lost. And we have, uh, last but not least, cradle to gate, where you only calculate up until the moment a product leaves the factory. Um, and intuitively, we all understand that, that this does not account for uh, the full impact of a product. And especially if you compare a circular product, so something that can be easily recycled or refurbished with a product that is always disposed and of use, uh, this simply doesn't uh, um, represent the full benefit of circular products, which is why we always advise our customers to go for LCA plus. But you can choose whether you want to communicate LCA plus or a different scope on the public passport. 
Then uh, we have some encoding options. Um, some of these uh, can be used, for instance, to connect directly with a PIM system. Others might be used because you have a serial number for a product or a specific batch number. It all depends on how you want to use the product passport and to what extent you want to dive into individual products or want to stay at a simply a type of product level. Um, um, from a legislative point of view, uh, for most product categories, uh, the passport will be mandatory on a product level and not on an item level. Uh, but still, we see in some cases, for instance, in the in the batteries that they do require uh, or will require uh, product specific uh, item specific information. We also have a tab uh, where you can record extra information and you can do so through links or uh, PDF files, other types of files or just plain text. Uh, and the idea of this is, as I explained, to make sure that the circular potential is not only realized in the design phase and in the way you set up your supply chain, but also by access by providing access to the information that is needed to uh, realize this potential. Um, you can add several um, uh, instructions or uh, uh, pieces of information to each of these categories, uh, and you can obviously link to the website of the product as well. Um, and as you can see, every passport generates uh, automatically generates a QR code. Um, Tyler already mentioned uh, that, uh, as I say, PIM is completely GS1 compliant. You can also opt to use a different bar or a different QR code or other identifier that is not directly produced uh, by our system. Uh, but then you would always incorporate the uh, the link uh, that is uh, that gives gives access to that public passport. And you would use that to create uh, an identifier of, for instance, a data standard uh, like uh, the GTIN of GS1, or perhaps if you're in a different industry, it's it might be the ETIN. Um, so there's 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 room to play with the way uh, you want to give your supply chain and your end customer access to that information. Um, like I mentioned, uh, it is pretty simple to uh, complete the passport with more information. Um, you can always add it uh, manually, uh, but the big uh, the big upside of this cooperation that uh, that we have with uh, SRC PIM is that we can quickly uh, generate hundreds, if not thousands, of passports, uh, which quite clearly saves a lot of time and effort. Uh, but also that we can update uh, the amount of passports that we have. Um, and even uh, delete uh, passports that are not necessary anymore through this connection with SRC PIM. Um, so it's basically a flying start to uh, starting to incorporate the digital product passport. Um, and we advise uh, companies to, to always uh, try and uh, use a, a structured central data point like the PIM system. Uh, to make sure uh, that you don't start working on various, uh, various in various systems uh, and lose overview of, of where your data is stored. Um, uh, and that way we can, uh, we can make much bigger strides in, in trying to complete uh, uh, this transition to a, to a circular economy. So that is, I think, enough for the demo for now. Let me quickly... Return to the slides. I'll move to the relevant slides. Just to give you guys a short recap before we go to some of the questions. Um, this is why uh, we have joined forces, uh, because we want to use data as a key to unlock the potential, the circular potential of, of products. Uh, we can structure, update, and create insights into sustainability data. Um, we can connect the passport and the PIM system uh, by SRC um, based on data standards uh, and make sure that we can make live changes, have our data in order, and create insights that provide not only better options to make sustainable choices for our customers, but also for the companies that use this digital product passport and the PIM system. So that is the uh, combined effort that we want to present you here. Um, before now, let's stay let's stay here for uh, for a bit before we uh, we close off the uh, the webinar because I did see quite a lot of questions in the uh, Q and A and chat. Um, Rens, have you 
do you maybe have some questions that are relevant to either uh, repeat um, or to uh, maybe dive a little deeper into? Um, I've answered most questions uh, in the chat uh, mm -hmm. by now. I'm going to answer one more um, regarding our standard. Uh, um, we might well or not use, but I, I, under, I realize now that I understood Ion's uh, question wrong. Uh, so I'll, I'll answer that to him uh, in a moment. Um, okay. <clears throat> we have some questions about how the DPP also could be used for um, an input for uh, sustainability reporting, for example, the CSRD. Um, yeah. uh, as some of you might know, we've already hosted a webinar on this topic as well. Um, and I'll make sure the people that are interested and they can let us know in the uh, Q&A, there's a specific topic in there. And we will make sure that these people get the slides uh, um, about this webinar as well, so they can look up uh, more information on those specific uh, topics. Um, I also saw another very relevant question um, from uh, Maarten. Uh, he asked if the developing a blockchain network would also be a plausible option to build a digital product passport uh, to guarantee higher transparency on data that we are collecting from suppliers that uh, mm -hmm. make the, DP, the DPPs themselves. And yes, this would be very, um, very beneficial to do uh, in the future. Of, as of now, we don't have the, uh, the capacity to create a blockchain ourselves. But that is a technology that we're looking into and I find very interesting. And we will watch closely how the market on uh, the use of blockchain in regarding to DPP uh, will develop and uh, see if we can jump into that specific uh, topic in the future. Yeah, um, yeah maybe as, as an addition to that, uh, Rens, is that um, uh, blockchain technology is, is applied in certain uh, fields of play um uh and we won't be doing everything so yes we can uh, apply blockchain technology but the question should always be what are we using it for um and one of the things that we will do in the uh, in the future is connect to tracing systems um uh, and that sort of systems are much more relevant to uh, uh to connect with and to to apply blockchain technology to because our digital product passport is is uh, based on material composition an end of use uh, and that doesn't require blockchain technology uh, because we take our data from a verified source uh, and it doesn't involve steps in the supply chain that have to uh, demonstrate uh, where a product has been um, but if we start connecting to tracing systems that kind of technology will start playing a role for us as well And I think regarding to most of the other questions, I think I've answered pretty much everything. I will look to it in a minute and check, and mm -hmm. otherwise these people will get an answer uh, as soon as possible. Okay. Peter, maybe did you uh, come across questions that were relevant in terms of the, the PIM system? Yes, uh, we, we had some questions on how uh, PIM would interact with the DPP and uh, some questions about data quality as well. But I, I've, I've seen that my colleagues already picked them up in the chat. So uh, thank you for okay. picking this up, Tim. Uh, I think we can conclude. OK, perfect. Um, yeah, so um, last but not least, I'd like to thank everybody for participating for the, the many questions uh, in the chat box and in the Q&A. Um, we'll make sure everybody who, uh, who indicated that they wanted to join the webinar, so either whether they were there or whether they missed it, will receive uh, 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 well the, uh, the webinar which we have uh, recorded. Um, uh, it's it will be available on YouTube uh, and on our respective websites uh, as well. Um, and um, if you have any questions or are curious about how you can take steps using uh, either PIM, the password, or ideally, of course, uh, the combination, uh, Find us here, uh, uh, and uh, we'll have we'll be happy to uh, to help you out. Um, and that's how we uh, are going to make positive impact with the combination of the DPP and product information management. Thank you, and uh, have a good day.